Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis, and as always, appreciate you listening. I am so pleased to have as my guest, author and Pulitzer Prize-nominated historian, Dr. James Presley. He has written the definitive book on the Texarkana Phantom Killer Murders, also known as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, and he is here to talk about his work with us today. The book, by the way, is called The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of the Texarkana Serial Murders, the Story of a Town in Terror. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here and talking to you, Eric. So I know you have some special connections to this case. Can you tell us about them and how they led you to write a book about the Phantom Killer murders? Well, for one thing, um, my uncle, Bill Presley, was a sheriff of Boyd County, Texas, which is the Texas side of Texarkana. Texarkana is on the state line dividing Texas and Arkansas. So there was a family connection there and. uh, he was the sheriff, and at the time, unfortunately for him, but perhaps fortunate for the events themselves, and he had been uh, not been in law enforcement before he was elected sheriff, but we had a Texas Ranger granduncle, my granduncle, his uncle, way back had been um, in the Ranger Force named William John L. Sullivan. He wrote a book called uh, 12 Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Plains of Texas. Pretty long title, but we call it 12 Years in the Saddle. And Bill and my father had known, as they were little boys, had known Uncle Will. So I guess this is the only um, connection with law enforcement he'd had before he became sheriff. But he had was a popular man and uh, won this race for a sheriff without a great deal of difficulty. But anyway, that was uh, perhaps one motivation because uh, this was a case that even today is uh, a remarkable one for Texarkana. If you think of the St. Valentine's Day murders massacre in Chicago, well, this is the version of it in Texarkana. And because the city is divided by the state line, there are two governments, Texarkana, Arkansas, and Texarkana, Texas, with their own fire departments, police departments, and so forth. And in this case, complicated the case, because you had two jurisdictions, and that can always complicate an already complicated case. But this basically, as I saw it, was a um, history of a mystery. And the the Phantom case was one of the first high-profile crimes during the post-war period. And there was a background of uncertainty, which added to the existing uncertainty of the case itself. Texarkana was the largest city between Dallas and Shreveport, Louisiana, and Little Rock, Arkansas. So it was large enough, it was a small town, but it was large enough to be recognized by in the region, certainly, and uh, as as it played out on a national stage, it, was, it came to be known nationally, even internationally, and uh, and <laughs> that uh, even today, which is you know approaching 75 years, I suppose it is since the 1946 case, is still probably the thing is noted most far unless you want to add uh, it's a birthplace in the early home of uh, Ross Perot, who died recently in the the billionaire from now in Dallas, and then uh, he later became an independent candidate for president. But um, this is the situation I came to. uh, I had done an eight-part series of articles about the case, Many years ago, it was a simple narrative in which I went out really to satisfy my own curiosity. And I freelanced it to the local, to Texarkana Gazette, not as an employee, but as a freelancer because I wanted to find out. And uh, this gave me an opportunity to do an article as long as I wished to make it. So 
I had no intention of writing a book about it then because the more I got into it, I saw how complicated it was and how difficult it would be. And I was writing another book by that time anyway. And uh, later, my uh, doctoral dissertation, which was not on, it was in history, but the history of diabetes in the United States, interesting or not. But I always maintained an interest in the case because it was history, which was my specialty. And, of course, uh, my uncle Bill Presley was one of the lead investigators. I might add that I really later decided to write the book because I had come to hear some of the versions of it, of the case that I knew not to be true. And so uh, one of the things that happened was the movie, The Town That Read Is Sundown, which at first purported to be uh, an account of the case, which it was not. It was fictionalized, which is fair enough, except that it needs to be you know, emphasized and uh, this gave rise to other imaginations and versions of the case. So this rather disturbed me as a historian that uh, I thought things should be reported as they existed. And therefore, um, I decided to, I, I would always collect information about it. I run across something and I had a pretty large file. But one day, I decided that a version of it needed to be done that would, could be reliable and definitive as to the extent it could be done at that time. Because, you see, this is many decades after it, and some of the major players in the case had already died. But fortunately, I'd interviewed them back in the series of eight articles I'd done. In fact, uh, when I started, my Uncle Bill Presley had also died. Max Tackett, who was one of the leading investigators on the Arkansas side, had died. But Tillman Johnson, who had been the chief deputy sheriff on the Arkansas side in Miller County, Arkansas, was still around. He's in his 90s, but he's very alert, and I'd known him for all those years. So he was one of the individuals I could call at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and not make him mad because he stayed up late even though he was in his 90s, and he was still alert, and he was very interested in this case because he'd been much involved in it. Only had one other friend I could call at that hour of the night. He was a morning newspaperman in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he um, stayed up late too, <laughs> as I did for much of the time of writing this. But um, at that time... There had been a lot of publicity about it. It seemed to have grown from the years. There was, the, of course, the movie, The Town That Read Its Sundown. And then The Learning Channel featured it on two shows on national TV, in both of which I appeared in, along with others. One was The Ultimate Ten Unsolved Mysteries, which ranked it in a virtual dead heat with Jack the Ripper, then mostly true stories which demonstrated how a real event may lead to an urban legend. And then uh, MGM several years ago backed a remake of the movie. And uh, the first version of the movie, it appeared in Italy, Sweden, and Finland, as well as in the U.S. Then the Chiller Channel, this is the first I knew of it, featured a case in uh, a series of killer legends, and I appeared on that. So it had lots of uh, publicity, and then the Internet came along to uh, spread the word even more. And some of that, unfortunately, was not quite accurate, which was another motivation for me to uh, get involved in uh, writing and research, which I knew it would be um, an extensive and at times intensive operation. So... I've always thought of a good beginning opening for the book and the event. could have been Charles Dickens, as he wrote in his opening for the A Tale of Two Cities, because this was the tale of two cities, Texas, Arkansas, and Texas, Texas. And uh, some of the things he has applied in the opening applied here. 
it was the best of times and the worst of times. Well, it was the best of times because World War II had ended just a few months earlier, and veterans were returning home in droves, and there was a promise of peace and maybe even prosperity. But there were hitches. There was a dark side to it because it was also the worst of times. The war was over, but the world was in flux, recovering from the war. And there was optimism, but it was dampened by uncertainty and a pretty good touch of chaos. The Cold War was waiting, but not recognized yet. So Texarkana was a microcosm of what was going on nationally and perhaps internationally with both the highs and the lows. It was in that backdrop a few months after the end of the war that the phantom struck Texarkana. And then nothing was ever the same thereafter. Serial killers existed then and have for a long time, but they weren't recognized as easily as they are today because serial killers attack strangers. And that makes it more difficult because people look for motivation. And the motivation for a serial killer often is not obvious. So the uh, Phantom Killer was basically a domestic terrorist. Basically, there were four incidents in about a two-month period that became known as the Phantom Killer era. They stretched from February the 22nd to May the 3rd, 1946. The first three were in Texas in rural settings. And the fourth one was in Arkansas on the Little Rock Highway several miles out of Mexicana. So to review those, on a Friday night, February 22nd, in the isolated Lover's Lane, Jimmy Hollis, 25, and Mary Jean Larry, 19, were savagely beaten, but they both lived. They had parked in darkness when the intruder appeared out of the night with a pistol and a flashlight. He ordered them out of the car, brutally beat the man, and terribly abused, as she said, the woman, and did not rape her. Well, Longman had little to go on. And on top of that, each one reported somewhat conflicting perceptions of their attacker. She believed he was a black man wearing a white mask of sorts, something over his face. Her date that night, who was older than she, was certain he was a white man, not over 30 years old. He didn't report seeing a mask, but he didn't refute her version as a gentleman should. So this is not uncommon, of course, because eyewitnesses often perceive the same event in different ways. By the time, they were both married, but not to each other. Each one was in the process of extricating from the marriage that hadn't worked out. But this led officers to jump to a conclusion that one or both of them knew the assailant and told stories to protect the man out of fear of retaliation. Or some of them wonder if a jealous suitor had done it. But Jimmy Hollis spent weeks in the hospital, and some of it in a coma, and he predicted when he came out of it that the man would kill next time. And he felt the man had felt he'd killed him, and he came very close to it. Well, a month later, in another lover's lane, just west of Texarkana on the Dallas Highway, Richard Griffin, 29, a World War II veteran, and Pauline Ann Moore, 17, were found shot to death in his car, which is a 41 Oldsmobile, on a Sunday morning of March 24th. Each had been shot twice in the back of the head. It rained during the night, washing away tracks that the murderer may have left, and this, of course, added to the complexity of the case. And on top of that, Mobs of the curious just trampled the scene, destroying any possible clues before the policeman could uh, come in and secure the scene. Now, at this time, no connection was made between the cases for weeks. 
There was no apparent motive, no likely suspects. It was just perplexing. And least of all did anyone suspect there was a serial killer loose because the term wasn't even in vogue at that time. Three weeks later, on the morning of Palm Sunday, April 14th, the bodies of two teenagers, Paul Martin, 16, and Betty Jo Booker, 15, were found near Spring Lake Park, which is on the Texas side also, outside the city limits at that time. He'd been shot four times, two shots at two different times, as it turned out. She had been shot twice. And you see there's a pattern of two-shot burst, as in the first couple. The car was parked a mile from Martin's body and two miles from hers. He was a former Arkansas side student. She was a junior at Texas High, of course, on the Texas side, and played a saxophone in orchestra, mostly of teenagers. On weekends, they played at a VFW hall. And after the dance that night around 2 a.m., Betty Jo Booker left with Paul Martin, but none of their friends ever saw them alive again. And because he was from Kilgore and had uh, grown up on the Arkansas side, the other members of the band did not know of him. So this uh, made it more difficult to, when they started looking for them, both of them they were missing the next day. Now, Texas kind of is a twin city, as I mentioned. It's right there on the Texas-Arkansas state line. And because of that, the FBI entered the case after the first double murders because they presumed that close to another state that uh, the killer could have gone to the other state or it could have come from them. And so after the second double murders, the Texas Rangers, who had been monitoring the case, they came in force, all of Company B, under the command of one of the most colorful Texas Rangers of all, Captain M.T., Lone Wolf Gonzalez. Now, this elevated, as far as the newsman's attention, to really a big, big story because the Texas Rangers were there. Things that brought the area's people's nerves on the edge. Stores sold out of guns, locks, window shades, as soon as they were restocked. But every night, the Texas Rangers and other officers on both sides of the state line, they patrolled the roads, especially the lonely lover's lanes. They tried to trap the killer. They stake out officers posing as couples, one as men, one as wigs with as a woman. But uh, the phantom didn't rise to the bait. So residents begin at this time to see a pattern. Three weeks had been the interval between the two double murders. So that meant if they followed the pattern, and a lot of people thought expected one, the next one would be Saturday night, May the 4th. So as the days clicked off, everybody was tense. People slept poorly, if at all. So each dawn, they were relieved because they were still alive and no further shooting had occurred. So all this time, there was anxiety. People wondered, was he the next-door neighbor? Was it someone who had a strange look to him? One couple came in to investigate from another city and said they knew who it was. I said, well, who was they? They said, they said well, it's a fellow who lived in their neighborhood in this other city. I said, well, why do you think so? Because he looked funny then. Well, I think you've looked over anywhere in this region. There were a lot of people who looked funny at that time because it was a day that people were knocked off the moorings. There was hardly any good evidence. And uh, naturally, the citizens became impatient. They wanted something done. Well, you know, the fact was they were doing all they could. Sleep was a luxury for the law enforcement people as well as it was for the citizens. And they drove themselves to exhaustion. I know my uncle told me sometime later. He was a sheriff at that time, as I said. And one day, he fell asleep on his feet in the middle of a conversation in a drugstore close to his office. This is, I think, typical, symptomatic of what happened to a lot of the lawmen. So 
all this time, the Arkansas side had escaped the Phantom's fury. That's not to say that uh, they ignored it, because uh, I think as far as way as Little Rock, I've been told that uh, people were afraid, scared to death, and certainly as far as Dallas and in between. And uh, in Arkansas, as well as in Texas, the lawmen had spread traps, poisonous couples in rural settings with nothing happened. Okay, we come to May of 1946. Several miles out of Texarkana, on the east, Virgil and Katie Starks lived in a frame house on Highway 67, which is Little Rock Highway. On the other side in Texas, it goes to Dallas, and it goes to Little Rock on the other side. Virgil was 37, Katie 36. They'd known each other all their lives. They'd grown up in the northern the Texas side and moved over to the Arkansas side, and he had, Virgil had 500-acre farm there and operated a welding shop here in their home. On Friday, May the 3rd, which was a long work day for Virgil Starks, he had a backache, and after supper, he relaxed in an easy chair by the window, read the paper, and listened to the radio. He had a regular program he was listening to on Friday nights. And dark came... And the window shade was halfway down. He just read a newspaper story about a man in Corpus Christi, Texas, who had been cleared as a phantom suspect. Officer to this time, had, they looked for suspects wherever they could find him. One man was in Los Angeles. He thought maybe he may have been the man. He was having trouble after the war. Turned out he was cleared. So this is how extensive this investigation went. Well... That night, while Virgil Starks was relaxing, his wife, Katie, was in an adjoining room. She called to remind him it was bedtime. He said, well, as soon as the story on this radio ended, he would be in. She heard a noise outside and asked him to steal from the bedroom to turn the radio down, but she never knew if he heard her. Soon afterward, an intruder with a twenty two automatic weapon Standing inches away from the window pane, shot two bullets into Virgil Stark's head, and he slumped forward. Now, his wife didn't recognize the shots, but heard a noise like breaking glass. She hurried into the sitting room where he was and found him dead with a pool of blood already forming on the floor. So she turned and raced to the telephone, which was on the wall, an old-fashioned telephone on the wall to call for help. The telephone in that armed community was very unusual. It may have been the only one there. There were very few telephones around there. Even in Texarkana, they were not as common as you would might expect. But she never made the call. The killer shot her twice in the head. See the two, pattern of the two-shot burst. She fell to the floor, so she would move out of the gunman's field of vision, and she crawled on her hands and knees to another room. She heard him breaking in the back, so at that time, she threw caution to win. She just got up and ran pell-mell bleeding out the front door, barefooted, before he could get inside the house. And It was dark outside, but then, bleeding and terrified, she ran in the dark to seek help from neighbors across the highway and the railroad track. Now, she survived because of her quick thinking and quick action, but she hadn't seen the killer, so she couldn't identify him. But what this made clear to everybody, then nobody was safe, even in your own home. Now, later, many people believe the Starks case was unrelated to the earlier attacks because the killer had to be someone who knew the couple. They couldn't believe a stranger had done it. But, of course, that's what serial killers do. They kill strangers. They don't want to be traced back to the victims. And in the book, I explain why the cases are linked and committed by the same hand. The same man had the opportunity and the motive, as I learned through examining statements and other evidence. Well, 
tensions rose, as you would expect, almost anyone could get arrested. A common crime, such as burglary, they took a nosedive. Burglars were afraid of getting shot. Practical jokers didn't have much room to maneuver. A male by himself was highly likely to get a free ride to the police station. People even distrusted neighbors, a stranger especially. And this led to one rumor after another, suspicions. I know there was one rumor reported that the villain was the son of a prominent family. But uh, it's pretty clear the evidence I collected he was much farther down the social ladder. In fact, there's one man, a black man earlier, whose tire tracks were found near the scene where Betty Joe Booker's body was found in Spring Lake Park. And he was apparently getting close to the trip down to the death row in Texas, in Huntsville, Texas. But Bill Presley didn't believe he was uh, guilty, but he didn't, the man wasn't helping himself out because he kept uh, denying. Well, it turned out he agreed to undergo hypnosis, and during hypnosis, it turned out he had been in the area for another reason. He had a, a paramour there, and he didn't want it to be known. And part of the suspicion on that one is that he had failed a polygraph test multiple times, right? Yes, yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. He failed the polygraph test, and it showed he was lying. And uh, But what he was lying about was about his relationship was totally unrelated to that. It was a girlfriend who was married in the area, and he didn't want to admit that. But under hypnosis, this came out. The truth, he told exactly where he'd been that night. And they cleared him. They investigated every little step. So uh, we wonder what happened. The newspapers all over the coast, as well as magazines, Time, Life, Newsweek, just poured in. And a lot of them were war correspondents returning from overseas. Boy, they this is a big story, and they tackled it with all the energy they could compile. So what happened? This was the last known case, the Starks case. So it's pretty complicated. Hundreds were arrested, grilled, and checked down. I've talked to people who were taken to the police station just because they were males at that time. But basically, it boiled down to a major suspect. He was an ex-convict with a long record named Ewell Sweeney. He ended in custody by accident. He was arrested for felony car theft in Texas, Arkansas, days after his wife was arrested when she returned to their stolen car. Now, I guess you'd call that serendipity because Max Tackett, who had been at that time a patrolman, a war veteran returned from overseas, returned to his old job at the Arkansas State Police, and he noticed that on every night that there had been a murder of this nature, in this case, there had been a car stolen and another car, stolen car abandoned. And one day, he had a call from his supervisor in Hope, Arkansas, which is about 30 miles from Texarkana. Max was asked to see a citizen who complained of a renter who skipped without paying his rent. It wasn't a big deal, but the man was a good citizen, and uh, they wanted to help him out. He was a farmer. He'd taken down the license plate of the deadbeat, whose name was Ewell Sweeney. Tackett had the uh, Hope office, the state police, run a check on the car. It turned out it belonged to a stolen car. So this upgraded it to a felony. They had nothing to do with the Phantom case. The problem was finding Sweeney. His relatives in Texarkana area didn't know where he was. But there's a five-year-old boy, remember, where Sweeney he usually left his car when in Texarkana. So the officers began checking the parking lot. And one day, the car turned out. A state trooper 
Charlie Boyd was on a stake out there, and he saw a tall woman in her early 20s claim the car. So he immediately arrested her and impounded the car. She was Peggy Sweeney, age 21. That very day, she and Hugo Sweeney had been married in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is about 75 miles from Texarkana. Well, the day before going to Shreveport, she had received a divorce in Texarkana from a Pennsylvania soldier she had married two years earlier when he had been stationed in Texarkana. It's one of those many wartime marriages that hadn't worked out. So the policeman wondered, where was her husband? No one knew. They later found out that he had followed her at a safe interval, and seeing the policeman, had fled. Two weeks passed, no Sweeney. Now, auto theft was a felony, of course, but the officer still had a serial murder case on the hands and everything else you could think of. So let's fast forward to a Monday afternoon, July 15, in Lenda, Texas, which is about 25 miles south of Texarkana. A slender, neatly dressed young man, white shirt and tie, drove into the car lot. He offered to sell his new Plymouth. Well, he didn't have a title with him, but he had it. He could provide it. So the dealer said, was, well, come back, get the title and come back. We'll talk about it. Of course, he was not a greenhorn. The dealer wasn't. He'd been around for a while. And he was already had his suspicions up because a car like that, people didn't want to sell them. They wanted to buy them. The man drove off toward Texarkana. So the dealer alerted the town marshal there in Atlanta. He radioed ahead to Texarkana. And officers began patrolling the downtown area. That afternoon, Max Tackett, Arkansas State Patrolman, believing this was the same man who had failed to pay his rent earlier, through a series of screwed maneuvers, caught the fugitive hiding. He dressed up in a truck driver's garb and went around downtown areas looking for a man who would make a quick move because he was going with the man who was uh, who had talked to him in Atlanta. He was dressed in a colorful cowboy garb. And uh, Max knew the suspect would recognize this fellow and not want to see him again. So he saw the man make a quick move. Max Tackett followed him, and the man hid on the fire escape at a bus station. Tackett drew his pistol. The man blurted out, Please don't shoot me. Tackett said, I'm not going to shoot you for stealing cars. The man said, Mister, don't play games with me. You want me more than stealing cars. Strangely, Tackett didn't uh, explore that. You know, he busy. He had so many things on their mind. They're still looking for a serial killer. And later, on the way to the Arkansas side jail, county jail, the prisoner turned to Tillman Johnson, who was the chief deputy sheriff at that time, and was driving. He said, Mr. Johnson, what do you think they do to me for this? Will they give me the chair? Johnson said, well, no, they don't give you his chair for stealing cars. To the surprise of everyone, but, you know, no one was... Uh, like I said, they were had their minds on so many other things. The prisoner said, do you think I could be lucky enough to get out in 25 years? Oh, Johnson said, you won't get much, maybe five or ten years. This is a pretty strange dialogue, but no one followed it up then. But everyone remembered it. From that point on, the prisoner didn't say anything. This was you only Sweeney, the same man that Tuckett had guessed he would be. So he and his wife spent their honeymoon in the county jail in separate cells on the Arkansas side. Uh, this wasn't big news. Car thieves plied their trade at that time frequently. It was very easy to hotwire a car and just drive off where they could do it in a matter of minutes. So the officers wondered what he meant by that. They went on to do the rest of their work that day. A few days later, Peggy Sweeney announced to officers that she would give a statement. Within a period of a few days, she gave three different statements that implicated Sweeney in the murders of Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker. 
the details varied from one statement to the other, but there was overall consistency. So this was the strongest case or suspect that officers found, and so they began to focus on him from then on. They step continued to follow any other lines of investigation or suspects, but they had some concrete evidence in her statements. Now, he was never charged with murder. The officers tried to find out the best way to keep the suspect behind bars, at least until solid evidence surfaced. For one thing, they needed the weapons he'd own so they could uh, make ballistic test. But that crucial point, they were frustrated. He had owned both 32 and 22 automatic pistols and possibly a 22 rifle, but no longer did. He sold the pistols to a man in a railroad work crew in western Oklahoma where he'd gone shortly after the Starks shooting. They left this area after the Starks murdered. So the FBI was never able to recovered the weapons. They had been sold to a man working under a flag name. In other words, he had reasons to not reveal his real name, and they couldn't trace him. He left that part of the country. They never did find him. But they had the testimony of his wife, or did they? Well, his wife could not be compelled to testify against her husband. And the officers believe this is the reason we need to take her to Shreveport for the quick marriage. There were other pieces of evidence, especially in the Starks case. There was a work shirt with the laundry mark Stark, S-T-A-R-K, on it, found among Sweeney's clothes, and he was known to steal clothes. And they had done uh, sent contents from the shirt pocket to the FBI lab in Washington, and they'd turn out to be similar to what materials have been found in Virgil Stark's welding shop. So this is a physical evidence tied in. And then there are other circumstances on the evening of May the 3rd. He'd had a heated argument with Peggy's sister over unpaid board money. And witnesses said he had driven to Texarkana soon afterward in an angry mood, which would take him past the Stark's home. But without the murder weapon and his wife's testimony that weakened a murder conviction. And so if he were tried and acquitted, he could not be charged with that particular crime again. So they began to find a way to keep him off the street, not for a few years, for a long stretch, as long as possible. So this added to the complexities of what was already going on. One of the possibilities was a habitual criminal act. The trouble was he was in Arkansas jail, and Arkansas had no such law at that time. They meant the most they could get him for was car theft. It wouldn't cost him more than five or ten years. But several blocks to the west, there was such a law in Texas. So if Arkansas wasn't certain he had an airtight or nearly airtight case against him for the Virgil Stark murder, maybe Texas could salt him away for life as a habitual criminal. So a lot of maybes infest all regions of the law, subject to jurors' decisions. But he easily qualified as a three-time loser and more under Texas Habitual Criminal Act with much of the maybe eliminated. Finally, what happened, he was extradited to Bowie County, several blocks across the state line, but not a simple matter because they had to go to Little Rock, the the governor to sign the extradition papers and so forth. But once in Texas, he was charged with car theft, easy to prove and convicted, with convictions from his previous record used for enhancement. So he was sentenced to life in prison. So is this the end of the story? Well, not quite. Each time he'd come up for parole, he'd fail. Because at that time, they would send a question to the local district attorney and sheriff and so forth and ask them, would they 
like to have him back in the community, and they'd always say no. And um, that kept that was one of the factors that kept him there. But later, he eventually succeeded in contesting one of the previous convictions that had been used in the trial for enhancement. And that was an argument. You know, he tried several other times, too. He tried to prove that he didn't have a lawyer and so forth in uh, his uh, conviction for under the Habitual Criminal Act. But it happened that an FBI agent was sitting in the courtroom and testified that the judge had, had asked him if he'd like to have a lawyer appointed, and he said, no, he wanted to defend himself, represent himself. So that failed. The next time he claimed that he wasn't represented by a lawyer in 1941, Arkansas car theft felony. He said um, the instrument for the case said that he was represented by counsel, but no attorney was specifically named. So if he could uh, prove that he hadn't been, the law had changed then, and he had a right to be represented. And if he could prove he had not been represented, then he would win his case. Well, he finally came before the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the law of last resort in the criminal category in Texas. It was a close call, but he was released. At that time, he spent 27 years in prison for this one case. And uh, that was one factor, a quarter century for a stolen car, plus the inability to identify with certainty a lawyer who had defended him. The prisoner claimed he had not been represented by counsel and that he had not been informed of the court they could have one appointed. But this time, the judge, the prosecuting attorney, and the sheriff were all dead and any survivors who had been involved in the case who were unable to recall any details that were so far back. So that wasn't the end of his criminal career, but he was out for a while. In both state and federal cases, he had everything from counterfeiting, car theft, that followed after that, and did go back to prison a few times but no new murder cases followed him. So he was never charged with any of the phantom killers. In fact, he outlived all of the three phantom case survivors and died in a nursing home in Dallas at age 77 in 1994. So uh, I would say, and uh, Tillman John agreed with me, that it's highly probable that the case could have been solved and closed with satisfaction in 1946 or 7 if there had been any of the number of improvements in forensic science that we have today. Specifically, DNA analysis might have determined whether Sweeney was guilty or innocent of any of the murders. And even though fingerprints were wiped clean at crime scenes, which indicates a skilled criminal had had some experience at this game. There were other materials existed. Near the Starks home where the killer's car was apparently parked, cigarette butts were found that very likely were left for the killer. It looked like the killer may have waited there until it got dark before he made his raid on the Starks house. And then DNA technology could have made the difference there. And also, uh, it was assumed there had been rape in the case of Betty Jo Booker, but there was not the definitive evidence that you would have in today's technology. And uh, this was another thing that was uh, leave some question about that. Now, a big... Uh, Factor is the FBI lab confirming the slag in the pocket of the workshop work shirt found in the Virgil Starr's welding shop was matched to the shirt that Sweeney had in his possession, so it indicates it may have been stolen that night. And then on top of that, of course, uh, the change in understanding of the law itself over the years. 
the state was unable to prove definitively whether Sweeney had representation in the 1941 Arkansas conviction used for enhancement in his 47 trial in Texas, but he made other claims. Now, at that time, at the same evidentiary hearing, when he sought release, as I said, the, a former FBI agent, Hallett, who had investigated the case, he had attended the 1947 trial, testified that he had offered, the judge had offered to provide counsel, but Sweeney had insisted he'd represent himself. So the judge, as I said before, was in that trial was dead by then. So he had no one to refute those claims. And then there was the fact of time, the potential witnesses had died, memories were blurred, that obviously played a role in his eventual release. But jurisdiction and the state line rose to huge proportions. And the different statutes of the two states played a major role in the case. So all of that played into that. Now, adding to the mystique of this case was the naming of it. When you name a case that adds to the glamour as far as the perpetrator is concerned, in this case, it made the phantom really a man of mystery. No one knew who it was. It very much added to the mystique of the killer and of the case. Today, some also refer to it as the moonlight murders, but there's no moonlight except in one of the incidents, which happened over a period of maybe hours or so in the Spring Lake Park of the Boca Martin case. There's under the cover of darkness. And this was a label that came from far away from Texarkana. And uh, I trace it back as a newspaper story that came, I think it's maybe from New York, one of the tabloids called it the Moonlight Murders, which it was not, and, but it still has been used on the Internet. One of the errors, I would uh, say, attribute to that. So how much time had gone by between the murder of Virgil Starks and Sweeney's arrest? Well, we're talking about the, the Virgil Starks murder was May the 3rd, and uh, Sweeney was arrested in uh, mid-July. So you had several months there involved. You had most of May, June, and half of July, let's say, or actually, you know, about two and a half months. But once he was arrested, the murders stopped. Yes, yes, yes. After the arrest, uh, that's one thing the officers say, well, murder stopped after that. Of course, some people say, well, he went elsewhere. And you know, whatever the reason is, it did stop, and there was none that seemed to be related to that happened anywhere in the area. So Now, there were some fingerprints found at one of the crime scenes that didn't match Swinney's, right? I think there were some on the Booker's, I mean, not Booker, but Paul Martin's car, which was really his brother's car that he had marred. But uh, this is a new-looking, shiny car, and uh, I can imagine how many boys would touch it and uh, just uh, feel it. <laughs> and at the time, apparently, they it didn't match any on file with the FBI, but then uh, if they were, say, a boys who had never been in the service, they wouldn't have been on file. There are other possibilities, too, that they, they would have to be been on file before, before they would have been able to identify them. So I always felt that they would uh, held on to the prints. I don't know if they, ex I doubt that they exist anywhere. Eventually, prints like that may have been on file, and today they could have been uh, compared easier than they could have been back then. Right. And there was a red flashlight found outside the Stark's window, but yes. no fingerprints found on it. No. Um, well, it probably had gloves, or else, it, because if he dropped it, he probably didn't think to remove fingerprints. So this indicates a man wore gloves, which also indicates some experience in crime, if not in murder, certainly in burglary and so forth. Now, this also links to the first 
the beatings of the couple, the man had a flashlight then, a very bright flashlight, and I suspect this is probably one reason the young woman with a light shining in their face, she probably, there may have been some glare, and she may have thought there was a mask or some kind of covering over the man's face. And unfortunately, that stupid pillowcase murderer character <laughs> from the movies yeah. is oh, associated yeah, yeah, with this. Yeah, that's uh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I will. Let, let me tell you about this. Uh, uh, whether you use it or not, you may find it of interest. When the um, town that read Sundown was filmed here in the Texarkana area, it came out, I suppose, the next year, at which time we were living in Austin, Texas, for about a year and going down to complete my graduate work. And um, it came out in an Austin theater. So I... (laughs) My wife wasn't interested in going, so I went alone, and there were four other persons in the movie that afternoon in the theater, two couples. They weren't sitting together. They were scattered over there. I was sitting by myself. I wanted to see what it looked like. In the beginning, it said everything in this movie happened. Well, that was later changed because... It was very different from the facts. But the point where they had the girl tied to the tree and the man was playing a mournful tune on the trombone with a knife attached to the end of it, and they started doing that, I laughed because that was so far from the truth. I thought it was humorous. It was a movie. It wasn't... You know, it wasn't a documentary. And at that point, the other two couples, they turned around and see who this weirdo was back there <laughs> laughing at such a <laughs> dreadful scene. Well, it was a dreadful scene, but it didn't even happen. It was so far removed from what actually happened that I couldn't resist. And uh, there were some, a lot of other parts in it that did not fit. And as uh, if it said, it's based on, which I think later they did correct that, it's based on the actual case. That's quite a different thing. It leaves you a lot of poetic license, but this one was, uh, at that time, was not a documentary. So knowing what you know about Sweeney's personality, and you even met him at one point, which I'm going to ask you about. Okay. But what do you think his motivation was? Even with his criminal background, I mean, this is this was a really extreme step. Well, um, in the first place, uh, his criminal activity, I was able to, very difficult to trace some of the cases, but I was able to go into the records and, of uh, county files and so forth. Apparently, his first arrest was when he was 12 years old. I was able to connect this with the uh, actual case and then the newspaper report at that time. And he went to reformatory. He, a, he had a, it's a very complicated background he came from as far as uh, the divorces and just a complicated uh, experience, but, you know, some of the other siblings also experienced something like that, but he was different. Now, among the FBI files is that he was, uh, uh, as they call a psychopath or sociopath now, personality, and that puts this in a different category, and this is what a profiler has told me that this killer did uh, fit into the pattern of a psychopathic personality. And I think that that is pretty well demonstrated by the evidence of the research I was able to do. Now, serial killers, they don't start out as killers, but they start out with different motivation, maybe petty, larceny, whatever. And then tend to, as they gain more experience, and not, not all psychopaths are killers, obviously, a very small percentage and then those who kill are not necessarily serial killers. What seems to be the motivation in this particular case, a psychiatrist at a Harvard 
related hospital told me that this is a case uh, I, I just without telling him anything about the major suspect I asked him I told him the major uh, facts of the case in the different episodes he said this is a man who was unhappy and he saw these people have enjoying life and he was not and he resented that and that was one of the motivations for killing and there's probably other ways you know he'd been in uh, this particular individual had been in prison and some prisons worse than others he knew that uh, federal prison was the place to go if you could go there instead of one of the state prisons especially Arkansas at that time and so uh, the incarceration itself can leave uh, an individual really looking for revenge. And by the way, one of the prison records I was able to find had, said he had a tattoo on one arm saying revenge. Now, these are indications of personality, reflections perhaps, but they're not uh, definitive in many ways. But you add these things up, and you have here in this particular case the Sharps case, he'd had a argument, very strong argument with his wife-to-be. She wasn't his wife then, the wife-to-be's sister over there not paying the rent money. And there was a very violent argument, and he left in a bad mood on the way to Texarkana, and he passed the Starks' house. Now, this is circumstantial evidence, but it fits in with uh, this type of uh, murder. Here someone is angry, he leaves, he sees this welding shop there and says, well, something I can steal there. He goes in, and um, we have some evidence of the shirt with the slag in the pocket, which did fit Virgil Starks' welding shop, the material in the dirt floor there. And then another thing I've never, I never could understand fully is that Virgil Stark's light was on as you listen to the radio and reading the paper. The shade was halfway down. In other words, you could see into the room with the light on, with dark coming on. I asked Tillman Johnson why he thought they must have been the only or one of the few windows in the entire area that didn't have the shades pulled at darkness. But I think it probably can be explained by the fact that it was probably daylight when Virgil Stark first sat down there. As night came on, then he was not aware of it being dark outside, perhaps, and didn't think to pull the shade down. And Tillman Johnson thought, well, maybe he thought it's right there on the highway, and that would be safe. Plus, none of the killings that happened in Arkansas had all been on the Texas side. So... All of these explanations make sense, and uh, that may be explained the way, and maybe Virgil Starks had no, certainly had no fear of enemies, or else he would have you know, done something about it, I think, anyway. Uh, there, there are just many small details in all of these cases. Interesting. So I did, again, want to ask you, you got the chance to sit down with Yule Swinney in the 1970s face-to-face. Would you share the details of that encounter with us? What happened was one morning, I remember it was a very cold January morning, and I was at my office, and the phone rang, and there's the editor of the Texarkana Gazette. He said, uh, we have a man that's interested in finding a writer to help him tell his story. So um, the editor knew that I'd done collaboration, so he called me. said, this man is uh, looking for someone to tell his story. He has an interesting story, it seems to me. I said, well, who is he? He said, you're Sweeney. I said, you're kidding. No, 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 no. He's here. He's here in the room. He's here at the office. But I could hardly believe that because I had not, this was before I had started writing the book, of course. I wasn't intended to write about it then, but um, I was working on another one. And um, But I had published the eight-part series of articles. So 
when you convinced me that he was actually there, he had seen an uh, item in the Tuscan Gazette. He was in town from Marshall, Texas. He was out of prison then. He was in Marshall, Texas. And he visited a sister who lived in um, on the Arkansas side of Texarkana. Looking at a newspaper, he'd seen little items that uh, told about someone who had uh, written a story about some event. And he thought, oh, she can tell my story. Well, he didn't realize it was not a local story. It was a wire story that, you know, they put in kind of a filler as a real brief thing. And Harry Wood, the editor, explained that to him. But he said he knew someone who does, has written collaborations. So I said, okay, I'll talk to him. Uh, I don't think I can help him, but I will. So we talked, and uh, he told me about how he was a prisoner down at the Huntsville Prison in Texas, and um, they were doing a prison scene in a Hollywood movie. And he talked to uh, some of them and told his story about how he was held down there for 25 years or so, and you know he's, he was innocent and so forth and so on. He said, "You've got a good story." Uh, I'm sure he didn't tell all, divulge all of the details. So he thought he, this is, a, he can get his story, make a book. So I uh, asked him, I said, well, um, now where were you at that time? He said, well, I wasn't even here. I said, well, I knew where it had been established. He was here, here in Texarkana. He said that uh, he was in um, Kansas City. I believe it was Kansas City. And uh, or St. Louis, one of the places, and uh, I had checked that out because in, when you go to prison, and certainly at that time, and I suppose now they have you tell your version of the story of the crime for which you were convicted. And he had said that he was working near a construction company. Well, that was not true. I called up there. And I, I always had evidence that he was in Texarkana at that time, but I called and and checked uh, whether there was such a, I think it's a green tree construction company, something like that, whether they existed at that time in 1946. The Chamber of Commerce said, no, it did not. There was no such place. So I had checked those out earlier, and when he said that, I said, well, uh, where were you? And he said that. And I said, well... We went on, so I said, what are you doing now? And he said, well, he's in construction. He's a supervisor, construction company in uh, Marshall, Texas, which is about 80 miles from Texarkana. And it was a very cold day. It was too cold to work. And so he'd taken the opportunity to come up and visit his his sister. Well, I finally, after a conversation, I saw that where this was going. And I said, well, I'm... I'm busy now. I don't think I can get to it. Once you talk to a newspaper man or someone in Marshall, Texas, and uh, I, Harry later called me back and said that he had uh, he had told when he told Harry that um, uh, well he's busy, can't do it now. Now after he left, apparently one of the uh, newspaper reporters there had notified. The police department and the sheriff's department. And uh, when he Sweeney left the building, the newspaper building, they were waiting for him down the stairs. And I understand they told him not to come back to Texarkana, and they accompanied him to the city limit. Now, this is the word I got from Tillman Johnson because they notified him that Sweeney was in town. So... <laughs> And it was not too long after that that he uh, got in, he left Marshall and got in trouble in Dallas. He ended up uh, continuing his incarceration. Well, this has been excellent. So your book is available pretty much everywhere books are sold. If it's not available in bookstores, they can always order it for you. And then, of course, you can get it online, too. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Well, I enjoyed it very much, Eric. Um, it's a privilege to be with you and, um, and to be a part of the most notorious. <laughs> and I think this fits right in with the other. It does for sure. It is a perfect fit. 
Again, I have been speaking to Dr. James Presley. He is the author of The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of the Texarkana Serial Murders, The Story of a Town in Terror. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.